Well, hey guys, welcome to Tales Slate Podcast, a podcast for independent filmmakers and movie lovers. I'm your host, Farid Chiron, joining you as always, and I'm also going to introduce my co-host, uh, Toby. Hey guys. And uh, for today, uh, we're joined by writer, director, first AD, quite a great one at that, I must say, um, and dear friend of, of ours. Um, I've worked with him on a number of projects um, in, pre- in pre-production, post-production, on set. He's just... Um, a wonderful person and storyteller, uh, Bernard. Welcome to our show. Hey guys. Hey, hello everyone. It's good to have you, Bernard. That's quite high praise. <laughs> not, not sure all of it is true, but I, I, uh, I try to manage. Disney paid us to to tell to say those compliments, bro. That's uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's where I came from. Um, yeah. No, guys, like, uh, really, it's great to have you, Bernard, and uh, so, Thanks. just so you know, the three of us went to the same film school together, so we have some pretty shared mem- right. memories, not only of hanging out with each other, but also of certain hallowed grounds that we've all treaded through in our time in film school, so uh, mm-hmm. definitely have some, uh, some common ground there, um, but before we get into any anecdotes or memories or something, guys, for this one, there's something that's come up in the world of cinema that just cannot, it cannot be ignored under any circumstances. It's something that I've been calling out to the heavens for for almost, I think it's like two years now, over two, two and a half years, and it's it's something that's monumental for not only what it means for directors and cinema moving forward, but what it means for uh, the relationship between the film movie community, like fans of cinema and, and, and the actual studios and the filmmakers. Mm-hmm. I'm talking, of course, about the Snyder Cut. Radio Rebel. Radio Re- yeah, I'm talking about Radio Rebel. Actually, I'm, to- I'm still talking about Al Capone from last episode. That's all I'm talking about. No, um, I'm talking about the fact that Zack Snyder announced finally that his cut, of his fabled cut of Justice League is finally coming out. Um, I've got a lot to say about this, and I, I um, but bef- so before I even do, actually, because I'm just going to go all out, I want to hear a little bit about what you guys say. I think, Bernard, I'll, I'll start with you. I mean, are you aware of what the Snyder Cut is, and are you, and I, have you seen the original Justice League? Have you League? devoted your life to the Snyder Cut, <laughs> to as the, some of us have? For the greater good. <laughs> How many virgin sacrifices have you done in the name of the Snyder Cut, Bernard? Well, um, just about enough, really. Perfect. <laughs> Uh, well, here's the thing. Like, I'm aware of what the Snyder Cut is, and I'm aware of um, the fact that there's uh, tremendous fuckery going on about. Can I? Can I? Swear? Yeah, you can. You can. Sure. You can. Just you can. Okay. Just, uh, there's. This uh, is a family podcast, Bernard. No, you yeah, can't swear. I, I, How I, dare I really you? I don't want to upset the the super Christian fan base you have. You guys have. We well, um, y- not no, anymore. Like, okay, apparently, I, we all we sa- God damn it. <laughs> yeah. Well, we sacrificed a few virgins for that too. Anyway, uh, you were saying, Bernard. So yeah. So I know what the. Um, I uh, I'm aware of the Snyder Cut. Uh, I'm aware that it's kind of like the same old story of uh what is it is it dc that's yeah. kind of like screwing over snyder um <laughs> same old story yeah it's true well Tale it is the same old, old story time. because here's the thing like i i um okay like you guys know this but i'm just gonna state this like for the record i'm really not a huge fan of comic book movies at all mm-hmm. it's really not my thing get and out i'm and moreover um <laughs> my position on it and we can elaborate is that like it's not nothing towards the fans. The fans can like what they want, but I'm really not a fan of like the industry of comic book movies. Sure. I don't think it's. I think it's more about when essentially it just comes down more about money grubbing than anything else. But that's just like my my opinion. Yeah. Uh, so there's truth. There's uh, truth. There's I'm, truth to that, by the way. What you mm-hmm. said about it, the mass consumption, like, and the corporation uh, that turns out these things. There's a lot of truth to that. Um, but how it pertains to this. Mm-hmm. But how it pertains to kind of the Snyder Cut and what it. Wh- what do you think it kind of means that a bunch of people, uh, like like a, like a fan uh, community, literally existed, some made something happen, like actually allowed for something to 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 come into existence like that. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it bodes well. Um, in general, for that's why I said like the same old story because like this isn't uh, endemic to comic book movies or, or the industry. Like it's just it, it uh, since cinema has existed, there's always been like it's always been like directors against their producers. Not that they can't work ever work together, but yeah. you know it's always that it's it's just a, it's an age old thing. Um, and while I don't think Zack Snyder's case is particularly um, Mm-hmm. unique in that way mm-hmm. it is true that what is unique is that pressure from the the, the public 
has uh, has caused this this uh, this cut to come out. Actually, actually, I I just learned through you that uh, that it was coming out. I knew the story. I didn't know it was actually going to be released. Yeah, so that's yeah. Good. He just announced um, it a couple of days ago. Yeah. Mm, uh, well, I mean, it bodes well. I I just hope like no, I, I I guess if you want to be pessimistic about it, you could say that. Um, that it's always going to take this amount of pressure, you know, and like, you know, what, what crazy, I mean, it's ki it kind of sucks that, uh, millions and millions of people have to, have to like, uh, petition and bash over and over <laughs> again in studio just to have something that should be as, yeah. as simple as like, uh, a director's cut being on the screen. Yeah. So like, I mean, cause it's an embarrassment. Then again, it's, it's an, kind of it's like a, a moot point because yeah. Uh, I mean, what am I going to do? You know, I'm, j I'm just a dude, you know, but like, I don't know. I think it, it bodes well, but um, it, it's it kind of sucks that we have to say like this is a victory or this is something that's, you know, mm. like that's unique. It shouldn't be unique. It well, should be the norm. Okay, so here's the but thing. So, um, no, fair point, fair point. I, I do agree with you that it's, it's saddening that something that should be, I mean, I wouldn't call it benign, but something that should be accepted as a, as a general kind of thing, like a director should be allowed for their their version of their movie to kind of be released and, and, and maybe not distributed to maybe a drastic degree because this is effectively another version of the, sa of the, sa of the same film. Um, yes, yeah, another version of the same film, and it's also kind of... The Snyder Cut is basically um, an apology cut in a way, I view it as, because the theatrical cut of Justice League had a lot of studio interferences, as most of us know. I mean, the internet is just exploding with articles right now about, you know, how... Um, the original you know, how, Justice League is bad and stuff. Yeah, yeah, and how, what, it, what the Snyder Cut is, and it's become kind of mainstream. So here's my take on the Snyder Cut, is I, I think that it's... I think while a director and studio collaboration is usually healthy and necessary, I think that having that back and forth between the producer, the suits as we call them, and then the filmmaker is important. It grounds the filmmaker, and especially when you're dealing with some pretty bombastic, you know, filmmakers like like Zack Snyder is a pretty, he's a pretty intense filmmaker. His movies can be very divisive. So I understand having a little bit of honing in on the talent. What was upsetting about that situation was that a Zack Snyder was he had to leave that project because of a family tragedy, you know, and. Mm -hmm. Uh, and above all of that, there were a lot of rumors circulating that they had really manipulated Snyder's cut and vision and, and contorted it even before he was leaving the project. And when he left the project, they found an excuse to basically completely retcon and change yeah. everything right down to the color grading of that. Like that theatrical cut of that movie does not look like any of his films. So it, to me, it felt as though there was a bit of um, justice, no pun intended, that, that we got a film that represented that filmmaker's original vision and effectively um you know because it was and it's four hours long it's a long film it's lots and lots of hard work from so many there's people. a lot of talk that they might cut it into six episodes yeah which is i think actually not a bad idea i mean yeah. you know if you've seen any of snyder's other other movies this is a director who likes to take his time and he likes to kind of um maybe not always use the time you know that wisely like lois lane searching for a bullet for 30 minutes i mean i got enough out of it but i understand that others were not as keen on it so it's like um but it, despite that i'm i think that wouldn't be a bad idea to like split it up um mm -hmm. so yeah I, i'm i'm delighted uh, because it says a lot about kind of uh it says a lot about what we can do with streaming platforms today to kind of uphold that basic standard of a filmmaker should have the right to showcase their work and especially when there's that much put into it you know if you finish a film or rap principal photography because I always knew there was an assembly cut at the very least these big studio movies like like kids when a filmmaker makes a movie that's 250 million dollars he doesn't just make it let the rushes lie around like one of my short films and then go and start editing six months later or whatever he <laughs> they are They're usually editing, editing while yeah, they're, they're editing as they're going. And, and especially with movies yeah. where there's so much money and, and a lot of stuff to keep track of, they have to. Like, they just simply have to. So, obviously, that existed. And also, they wrapped shooting. And Snyder, I think, stayed on three or four months after the, the wrap. So, they were knee-deep in post. So, there was definitely more than even an assembly. There was, like, some kind of, like... There was some kind of watchable cut. Um, this version is going to basically finish off the effects. They're going to put $30 million into it or so. Which I was surprised by. I didn't think that Warner Brothers were gonna take that leap, but you know this HBO Max thing has changed everything. Like it's 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 a streaming service for that Warner Brothers is now using 
to, for their films and it's allowed for something like this to happen so like you said it, it's it's actually looking looking good for what this could mean for the industry um, and what it means it's, it sends a, a powerful message like they're like uh, like Toby as you may know about the Han Solo movie like I'm, I'm saying all the things Bernard doesn't like Star Wars and comic book movies but if, if you if you look yeah. at if you Bernard look at doesn't like anything here. fun apparently <laughs> I'm just waiting until we talk about real movies. But oh, that's, that's all right. okay, man. We're, we're getting to Taxi Driver in a minute. But like, the 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 thing with that solo film, right? Where and, and it's a, it's not a coincidence that all the movies I'm talking about are big studio films, where mm -hmm. um, there is that level of power at the top of the of the food chain. Like, yeah, I mean, um, well, if it wasn't a big studio film, it would just be the director's cut. There's no one else you need to press. Well, that, well, yeah, I mean, exactly, that's true. But even so, like, it's no coincidence that in the studio system, we see these alternate versions pop up more frequently. You know, it's rare that we get sort of, like, for example, if Bong Joon-ho comes out with an, a new version of Parasite, it would be sure, a, it would be a surprise, but and a welcome one, but it would kind of be like, like, then I, I wouldn't feel like it's because of some suits, you know, that took over Bong Joon-ho's movie for the original. This, like, <laughs> this, the, guys, this, this version of the film's for my mom. It doesn't have any swear words in it, okay? Ah. Like, nice. if she asks, this was the official version, <laughs> nobody tell her otherwise, okay, guys, I don't want to get in trouble. You won't. That's my impression of Bong Joon-ho. It'll be our secret. It'll be our secret, man. Between you and me and... You speak very good Korean. You, you, you me and Bong. Yeah, Toby, I've heard... You, yeah, like, I, you should see him... It's um, pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I thought he was actually Bong Joon-ho yeah. on the podcast. I was like, what? You should yeah. hear my Russian. Mm -hmm. It's it's great. <laughs> I want to just touch up on one thing, which is let's look at Ridley Scott's career for a second, because uh, Ridley Scott's a great example of the director's cut situation. Because Ridley Scott's made several movies. Um, he's one of my favorite filmmakers. I think Ridley Scott's amazing, and he hasn't always made the best movies, but he's made some great ones. And Blade Runner obviously is notorious for being the the king champion mm -hmm. of like director's cuts. You know, there was recently a new cut yeah. again. There was a new, I think like the, the last and final cut, the last, last final, final cut. <laughs> What's it called? I don't even know. And that's an example of a director going back to their film, which was meddled, but not as drastically as the Snyder thing, mm -hmm. and tweaking and, and making changes. You know, making Deckard a replicant, which was a huge mistake, but that's okay. And, you know, doing all this stuff. And it to me, it's like, um, that to me was always what a director's cut meant like ex for a director to expand on the material like kingdom of heaven which is an another ridley scott movie it's a totally different movie when you watch the director's cut like the director's cut m makes that movie from mediocre to like pretty pretty good like it actually changed the way that film turned out mm -hmm. so it's it's like um and actually bernard i think uh i had told you before like if you'd seen the shining and if you'd seen its sequel doctor sleep i don't know if you caught the doctor sleep or not well i I, I meant to watch it, but I'm kind of like an asshole, and I okay. was super busy all this week, and I, I didn't manage to, to watch it, unfortunately. I'm sorry about that, because no, I, no, I, I meant no, to. No, that's okay. It's okay, man. Bernard. I didn't watch it either. Uh, yeah, no, we're all, however, we're all assholes, man. It's fine. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I, I did watch the original Shining again. Oh, uh, that's good. Because I intended to watch both, which, uh, by the way, not to go too much on a tangent, but the original Shining is... Um, it's a strange movie to me because, like, I'm all about Kubrick. I fucking love him, and yeah, yeah. Uh, and pretty a lot of people say that it's one of his best movies, and and that it's so scary. I think it's a very good movie, but I never mm. really honestly found it scary. Because we have like classic movies that are held mm -hmm. up to us in such esteem and such high regard. You know, mm. we're often mm. we're often shoved Citizen Kane and and Godfather down our throats. Like, watch this, and and if you do not like it, you mere mortal. If you don't like this, then your taste in I cinema is those. all but inferior. You know, and mm. I I love them too. But the, here's the thing, man. Um, it's uh, first off cinema. But I know, yeah, I I agree with what you're about to say. Yeah. Like classics aren't just yeah. good movies just because they're classics. Well, yeah, exactly. And all cinema remains subjective as experiences, so we can like or dislike anything we want. You know, like I could fucking hate mm. the Godfather if I really mm -hmm. wanted to. Well, not if I want, if really I felt beautiful. like it, but I don't. I really love that film. You know, I, um, and it is it is great. And so. We'll start with The Shining and then we'll make our way to some others, but um, your take on The Shining, Bernard, which was that you didn't find it particularly scary. Now, I don't think this The Shining is scary so much as mm -hmm. just very unsettling, very disturbing. It's a film that, that oozes a certain atmosphere that 
is 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 mm. is chilling in terms of its tone, in terms of its execution. But because I feel it's a combination of how horror movies are today, where we're kind of it's also to do with sort of just innate sort of memory association. You know, we see horror movies mm-hmm. today, which naturally have these bang like loud noises and jump scares, yeah, and yeah. with a certain they're super saturated, very too. saturated, and there's a it's pretty crazy. Yeah, and there's a certain you know, I mean, yeah, the <laughs> franchise milking in that is insane, man. Like Saw Seventeen coming to a theater near you, but like in the yeah, in the yeah. case of the actual film making like discounting some filmmakers like Mike Flanagan who did Doctor Sleep or um, oh god there's so many good ones um, James Wan does some good stuff with his Conjuring films um, those are like those are like good crowd pleasing horror movies you know um, and then you got Robert Eggers who does like like you know very unique surrealist stuff like with The Lighthouse and The Witch but the thing is modern day audiences have a very particular perception of horror that there has to be a loud noise that there has to be a certain mm. build up and a certain like we gotta see the ghost and we gotta see it in a certain way back then what constituted as horror horror was just an unease. It was a sense that the atmosphere was oozing a certain dread that just put you in a place that was ho- shocking. So it goes beyond, in 1980, what must have been scary. I think that it can still remain scary, but it just kind of depends on the subjective experience. And yeah, it's now perfectly... We call those- <laughs> Now we call those more like psychological thrillers now. Exactly, right. like that like, started. Uh, like that's that's, right. that's started. Like horror actually has to do with a murder or a monster or a ghost or something. Right, and it kind of started with the Sixth Sense a little bit, like the idea of like a supernatural thriller. You know, I was like, the fuck is that? And I think that it it's it's now at a point where I um I, I think that one can who's from our generation for example in their 20s we can there can be people who find the shining scary but i understand that that's not the immediate reaction um but it's still like i think toby you also having seen the shining for the first time i think um it'd be cool to hear your take on what you thought of it but also if you found it scary and in and in what way um so okay so uh i originally saw the shining because i was going to watch dr sleep because you told me to Fareed. <laughs> i'm behind I, this big but then i was to an... get everybody to watch dr sleep like well, you he watch is dr. the sleep. he is the sole reason dr sleep made many any money at the box office he told everyone to watch it he's been telling them for weeks it's it's probably why it's probably thing. why it probably why it bombed but okay uh, you don't have that <laughs> many it's, friends it's quite good. <laughs> um but uh <laughs> Free doesn't have the, enough friends to get that end game money for Doctor Sleep. Nah, man. Nah. Anyways, he, do you have a promo code for Doctor Sleep or something? Regardless, anyways, I saw The Shining because you told me to, and also it's it's a it's a perfect film for quarantine during the yeah. this pandemic because in a, in a morbid way, yes. Yeah, and it also makes you kind of catch yourself where you maybe you're like, ah, oh, geez, maybe I'm acting like Jack. You know, that's maybe I shouldn't do that. But uh, anyways. What I, uh, the, so the first two acts, I kind of had my arms crossed and I wasn't that impressed with. I was like, this is the film that no, everyone won't shut up about. Everyone mm-hmm. keeps telling me, you gotta see The Shining, you gotta see The Shining. Oh my god, you haven't seen The Shining? Like, on yeah. a side tangent, don't you guys just hate it mm-hmm. when, uh, like, you haven't seen a classic? And then everyone's like, you haven't seen that? It's, it's like, yeah, I haven't seen, but I've seen other stuff. And it actually yeah, makes, it actually, it'll make you hate that movie when you see it. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. oh, it's not even, like, you'll feel like, like I'm, I'm kind of roped mm-hmm. into this. But also, it's like, it inflates your expectations for something. Yeah, and you know, then when like, you finish, you're like, this was it? This was the thing? But yeah. something happened in the third act. You can spoil know, it. You can I, spoil it. It's The Shining. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what happened to it. at what point though I don't yeah. know what happened or that but at a certain point I found myself really enjoying it I, I agree with Bernard I never found it scary yeah but I honestly it made me start thinking and made me and I and when I finished the film I had this gut instinct to immediately rewatch the film again yeah and what I really love about it is that let's say you take the ghosts out of it it's the story of an abusive family and an alcoholic and like if you take all the spirits out that dude was already on that path to begin with and it really makes you question things like okay so the last family who did this it was this dad and he ended up killing his two daughters and his wife and and then you start thinking okay well maybe is is this place haunted or is it maybe these people who's the type of person who's willing to just drop their life for three months yeah. and moved to somewhere else to live in a hotel with almost no connections probably not someone who probably someone who's a screenwriter uh, yeah exactly a screenwriter and who's more unstable than a screenwriter 
I'm sorry. This is this is getting personal now, and I don't know how to feel about oh, it. Oh, you know, yeah. That, those that moment where Jack like is speaking to his wife, and he's like, "I'm trying to focus, and every time you distract me, you're." You make me out of focus. So how about every single time I'm in here, you don't bother me. I've had, I, I looked at myself and I was like, oh, oh, he's a screenwriter. Oh, no. Oh. Yeah. I yeah. see myself sometimes in that when I'm really into something. And then, like, someone will come with a plate of snacks. And I'm like, can't you see I'm a genius? Yeah. I'm trying to make art. <laughs> and you act like such and a then little diva. Cut back to the page and it just says, Toby was walking down the street. And <laughs> yeah, the only it's thing like, you, yeah. You, you've written in like, like an hour. Can I just yeah, say? You're just can like I, can writing I, about Jarman. And... Yeah. Can I just say how uh, I've always found screenplays look kind of pathetic when we try to uphold them as like artistry, even though we know full well they're art. Like when you actually read a screenplay, it's not exactly Dostoevsky. You know, it's like int cafe day. John walks inside, orders a cappuccino. Ca- uh, uh, the counter person, would you like some sugar with that? And then, like, John, yes. You know, there were, I've always found it hilarious when, like, someone's, like, you, you know, like, really uphold, like, you know, my script kind of goes into the human condition, and it's all about the, and then you, just the minute I see, like, fade in, I just, like, start to lose it. Like, I'm just, like, <laughs> okay, like, chill. Um, but that's just a little tangent I have on how we treat screenplays as, like, pros or not. But Screen text. Yeah, screen text. Two days and that's earlier. The, and again, not a knock on screenwriters. I think screenwriting is an immense uh, and powerful art form that should not be underestimated, as it sometimes is. But they, they look like they look like Bloody. blueprints, you know? So, anyway, back to uh, mm. The Shining. Back to The Shining. So, so Toby, you're pretty Creed much... is the reason that screenwriters get shit on. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm gonna cut like 70 pages of that script someone sent me. So, um, I think, okay, so I happen to find The Shining very scary. Um, and for me, um, cause I understand what you're saying, Toby, and I, and I fully understand uh, what you're saying too, Bernard. Um, I guess for me, it just boils down to the fact that there's something very, um, retentive or there's something about the way Kubrick shoots that I've always found cold and it's a common criticism actually I mean Bernard as a Kubrick guy you'd know like people are always like Kubrick is great but he's really cold and emotionally hollow and distance distant you know mm. and and that he there's always this feeling of like unless you I mean for me I've agreed and disagreed because I think it varies from each film well, isn't that why people I, love him because he mm. reminds them of his their dads I w- wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, he is. Let 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 me let me distance. just let me just lie on my couch so Toby can uh, can psychoanalyze me a little more, man. I, I would. Isn't that why you guys love Kubrick? <laughs> he reminds you of the father that just wasn't there for that baseball game. Bernard, I'm gonna well, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the splendid opportunity to ignore that question and continue telling me why uh, what you think <laughs> of Kubrick. <laughs> well, Kubrick is a very distant guy. For sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I don't know him, but like from, from the. From, <laughs> he used to play golf. The, used to play golf together, man. Don't lie. From we used to play chess together. That's, oh. That's his deal. Oh, that's right. That's right. Um, well, he he does come off as a very distant guy, but like the more you research it, the more material you read on Kubrick, mm. uh, you find that he was actually kind. Of, I think he was, was pretty like easygoing in a lot of respects. Like he's pretty. He's a funny, like witty dude. Yeah. You know. Yeah. He's just. He's, he's he's emotionally stunted, but I don't think he ever his like movies, meant to be. I think his movies were emotionally stunted. I mean, the, and his movies had mm-hmm. this kind of walking calculator type feeling. But I do think, well, again, yeah. not always. Like Paths of Glory has some beautiful stuff in it. Like when his, I think his wife Christiana was in Paths of Glory and she sang in German in that one scene, and um, it it can make you cry. And it, for Kubrick, it was like I'm gonna marry that girl. But um, you can also look at um, some of the behind the scenes things. Like you hear that Malcolm McDowell and uh, is that how you say it? McDowell? I think I got it. And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, Kubrick. Ronald McDonald. That's right. He had red hair. Um, they were doing the ADR for Clockwork Orange. And I don't know if you know the story, Bernard, but uh, they were actually in between uh, doing the takes. They were playing uh, table tennis or something like that. They were, or ping pong or some, you know. And mm. uh, yeah. the thing about Kubrick is even though they had this really heartwarming relationship during that time, the moment the, the shoot kind of ended, Kubrick basically exited Malcolm McDowell's life completely and he was younger and unaware of the fact that when you're on a movie at least at the time and yeah even today it depends you know it depends on each person in the movie but like usually there's this this like period when you're really with that person and you're making the film and then it's all over and Kubrick was very much like that where it's mm-hmm. like now we're done and Kubrick never bothered I don't think really ever came uh, to contact yeah but I, I totally get that which yeah is understandable you, you have to 
y you have to be like chummy with like a th hundreds of people, and you can't. You know right. I mean? Especially a hundred like friends. That sounds the op like the opposite of a problem. Yeah, that's the kind of person that can can get doctor sleep money, you know. Uh, but it's 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 true. Okay, that's true. That you know you do move on because that's just how the business works. Like you've got because it, it's gonna keep happening. Um, but there are not many instances of like Stanley Kubrick was difficult. I mean, aside from the, aside from the Shelley Duvall thing, of course. That's yeah, yeah. it's it's like. And that was purposeful, even though I don't agree with what he did. It was purposeful. Um, it's not really the man more than the films, where I feel like what made The Shining scary for me was that he has a very cold eye as a filmmaker. Um, maybe not as a man, but as a filmmaker. And so mm -hmm. there was a, the more impersonal horror is to me, weirdly enough, the more it frightens me, because I feel as though um, it's... Because it's, it's, I'm maybe just naturally a person who likes to kind of have a lot of people around and really have conversation and get to know people, you know, to their core. It's like I'm very... Take them to doctor sleep. Take them to the doctor sleep. Like, just get those tickets in, you know. But... And so when you see a movie that's, by contrast, something that's quite distant and vacant, it's... it, it To me, it kind of got me. Because it felt like an alternate reality, you know. Because The Shining does a great job of bringing in something that's kind of fantastical I dare say into an environment that at first despite the kind of perfection of each shot being in the Kubrickian meticulousness it still felt pretty grounded you know so I think it, it what got me was that that chilliness of it um, so yeah um, so okay Shining that's that's I guess what we all feel about it Dr. Sleep mm. I'll just quickly touch upon because you haven't seen it you guys but before you do yeah um, I think it's, it's worth mentioning there's a there's a pretty good documentary that came out just recently uh, about Kubrick, and it was made by the the French and German channel Arte. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard about this. Like yeah, yeah. Yeah, I saw it. So maybe like I'll find a description because I think it's like it's pretty much split between languages, and I'm pretty sure it's subtitled as well. But it's mm. like free on their website, or at least it was like in in March. So if I find a link, uh, I'll send it to you guys, and maybe like put in this description for people who want to see it. For sure. It's pretty good. For it's sure. pretty good. It like trend, trends on uh, on like the common cubic ground stuff that everybody knows but also that that side of him that was more like almost sweet in a weird way yeah but it was like a mm -hmm. just a just a dude you know yeah yeah so it's pretty good anyway go on about dr sleep well i mean i, I was <laughs> just, just kidding. gonna very just kidding. i was just gonna very briefly touch on uh how for that for me that movie really worked because i felt like it was this cinematic act of like trying to add some well not only stephen king back in this into that into that universe but also basically infuse a bit more heart into that film you know what i mean and i've heard from multiple people that that film felt very 90s in a way where it just from the way it looks in a, in a way the way it's way it's shot but and and i agree with that actually but for me why uh, that still worked for me and when i say 90s i mean it had like a kind of a glossy you know a bit of an old school approach to filmmaking like the way it's made it doesn't feel like horror movies today which for a movie that's a sequel to the shining that's a good thing but it also just felt like a movie with a certain uplifting feeling, which was, and, and it applies that to the Overlook Hotel that it was in Kubrick's film. So it's this weird blend of like seeing a director who's known for being a little bit more cold and infusing warmth into that. So I really recommend, even if, mm. even if like you won't end up liking the film, which, you know, I'm, you know, I, I, I understand that, I still think it's well worth seeing just to see it as an experiment, you know, for how a director can oh, go sure. back and, and check that out. But actually, I want to throw this over uh, to you about something, uh, just to do with classic films, right? Give me, uh, Bernard, I'm going to ask you this, like, what are some films mm. that are renowned as classics that, you know, are, are, are adored that you just don't see yourself kind of liking that much? Like, that you think, oh, you know what, I, I don't really, I didn't really feel it, you know, like it wasn't for me. Mm, yeah, um, it's a good question. Uh, I personally... I think it's got a lot to do with time. Like I don't know about everybody on this on this matter, but I'm pretty much sensitive to like time, and uh, and it sounds really pretentious when I say it like that. But what I mean is like, uh, for example, like everything, pretty much everything with the French New Wave, I never really got it. Like you know, like I I, I totally respect it. Um, I respect its contributions. And I respect what it's brought to cinema, like forever. But at, at the same time, uh, it's kind of disappointing to me because actually, on the paper, uh, the new wave like seems fucking awesome. Like a movie that here's a, a an actual movie that could answer your question. Um, I always thought that I would really be into Breathless by Godard because the way it's like 
the way it's mm. uh it's told like what it what the what the story is on paper like i could really get behind that i really like the sort of like uh drifting through city like uh like stories like to me it, it was i thought it was going to be like lost in translation in a in a way but it really like is it's ugh, uh, like i feel bad for shitting on it but it was too experimental like you know you don't uh you, you guys obviously know this but i think it may not be obvious to to uh anybody listening but i'm french so there's a lot of like there's a lot of baggage with the french new wave it's like um yeah it's still like very much a revered thing in france although i don't think like the younger generation like my generation uh really holds it in super high state but like the french new wave in france is like it's pretty nuts because it's ironically become really solidly cemented uh as the 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 uh, the cinema that they were protesting in the first place like people who are all about the french new wave it's like it's like you <laughs> i I've, I've legit been told like by french teachers at at the film school like oh you guys are just students you you shouldn't try to uh, to do some crazy things and experiments you sh- guys should learn from from the classics from the masters like truffaut and godard who are like literally the people who would experiment the most so it's kind of like paradoxical so that uh i guess that area the the, f- the whole french new wave and it's kind of like what you said earlier like the more people will tell me it's a classic it's a classic like usually that kind of like loses its sheen but um i try not to look at movies like you know like they're classics therefore they must be seen you know i'll i'll just see what i can what i can glimpse from them um what else are there any singular movies that i really don't get i really don't get star wars either sure. but, like, but star wars is like at this point like it's a religion to people you know what i mean so it's like i i completely yeah but i don't get that yeah i understand no i mean look even uh, i think it's probably have all to right be very young when you see it i only saw it like uh when i was in my teens so i never really got mm. it i was younger so but i mean i really good. love empire strikes back and i mm. like the last jedi but <laughs> oh, and Rogue One's pretty good, but yeah. like I did like yeah, Rogue One actually. I was really pleasantly Rogue surprised by it. I thought it was yeah, it, it was really what like on the level of epic that Star Wars always wanted to be. Well, it's and a I know war that's film. like not a it's not a cool thing film. to say because yeah, yeah, Star yeah. Wars made in the seventies, so obviously you're ever, limited in technologically. You ever notice that Star Wars doesn't actually have any strategies? Like they never strategize like how to win the war. They just like good versus evil and they just crash into each other and hope for the best yeah well well it's based on the i mean on the flash gordon serial episode format so like they... i think it's pretty much like uh, uh I, I, it sort of resolves that problem in itself though because star wars is also about like it's also openly about being fun you know what i mean like being being entertainment sure so it's sort of like quid pro quo. It's like uh, yeah, but there you are plot have holes. Strategy and be entertainment, you know. Yeah, yeah, but I don't think Star Wars really meant to push the envelope about like war films. You know what I mean? Mm. I, I, don't, I don't feel it that way. I think it was more just about the whole ride. You know, the whole experience. Yeah. Not about the fine detail of it. Well, yeah, but like, uh, like it's always about the experience. It's always got to be a pleasant experience for the audience. But I mean, like, wouldn't it just be interesting to see a Star Wars film where they oh, actually absolutely. strategize instead of having like, okay, your spaceship's going to go this way, and we're going to try to shoot this one. Maybe they could have like actual flanks and different. A- absolutely, but then it then it wouldn't really be a Star Wars film. Yeah. Yeah, it because be because else. because at this point we've become so I mean I dare say desensitized to what we what we perceive of to be Star Wars. I mean I don't want to go on to Star Wars too much, guys. But like like when Force Awakens came out and there was this whole thing of this is too much like a New Hope. I think that I didn't mind that because I felt like it was a conscientious conscientious decision to make you know to get that nostalgia back, of course. But also like we have come to associate the feeling of what Star Wars is with the original trilogy, and it was just a way for them to be like. This is that. We're back to this again. Because the prequels had their own thing going on. Anyway, anyway, Star Wars, Schmar Wars. I, I actually want to go back to... You know, it's funny because this film about... That can't be your excuse for everything, Fareed. <laughs> Star Wars, Schmar Wars. Well, <laughs> Schmar Wars. The, it should be the, the name the, of this episode. The, the, the release the Schmar Wars cut. You know, the uncut uh, version of, of Star Wars no one has seen. But, like, I, I, I like... 
Okay, look, I don't really like Breathless either that much. You know, in fact, in fact, there's a Richard Gere remake that I got more out of because, you know, like Tarantino famously called it one of the coolest movies he's ever seen, the remake. You know, it's just got like, it's... It, it, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, That's interesting. It's an interesting okay, film. Cool. It's, 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 mm. It just has more of that cool factor to me, but uh, I'm not saying it's better than the original. I'm not, again, I'm not like Breathless isn't it likely, like it isn't a kind of movie I'd say is, is great that the remake kind of, to me, does an even better job or anything. It's just like, I've just generally that story for me never quite clicked. Um, and I completely understand. I mean, when we were in school together, I, I also was often told like, you know, I mean, I was in the international department of the school, you were in the French department, so there's some differences there. Um, and in the international department in the third year, there was more incentive to try new things uh, because our teachers would be like, okay, now you can, you know, we had exercises and stuff. But even so, I often did, I did feel a, a little creatively shackled to what I perceived as being able to get the green light because you have to like you have to like it's not guaranteed you know you may not be able to make a film if you don't get green lit by the by the the teachers or the student uh, whatever the the committee and um, I did feel sometimes a bit creatively shackled if I tried to be a bit radical in my approach um, and that doesn't mean I'm just gonna make a movie about like you know where we're, we're staring at a turtle for like 10 minutes or something but like you know something that was atypical um, that was, you know, kind of trying to be a bit avant-garde, let's say. I, I knew that could be tough. So I kind of get a sense of what you mean about, like, being creatively coerced. But Godard, for me, man, I was never a big fan of him. And I, I appreciate his contribution to cinema. I appreciate what he's done for editors everywhere with the jump cut. You know, what, what he did in Breathless, mm. no less. Um, and I have a soft spot for Vive Sa Vivre, I kind of like. Um, so there's some movies of his that I don't mind. Um, like... New, new, the new wave for me is a mixed bag. Actually, like I love some of Truffaut's movies. Like I love the Four Hundred Blows. If you've seen that, Bernard. Um, oh yeah, that's yeah, really that's good. That's a beautiful good movie. And man, actually, mm. side note, the the good. best best friend in movie history is not Samwise Gamgee. It's Rene from Four Hundred Blows. <laughs> that dude, yeah. he shows up to that hostel at the very end. That's a bro. <laughs> you remember that? Mm. Um, <laughs> huge fan of that. And of course, my favorite filmmaker from that period is Alan Rene who made uh, Last Year in Merry and Bad, which is one of my favorite movies, and was a huge influence on my last short film, actually. So mm. uh, I tried to watch that once. I couldn't really get into it, but I, see that I think fine. I might like it as well. Isn't it like kind of like, well, isn't it kind of like The Shining in a way? Yeah, isn't yeah, it like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really weird, creepy film. It is, it is. It's very bizarre. Well, not creepy, it's just bizarre. Uh -huh. It's just very bizarre and experimental and kind of epitomizes what people think of when we talk about, like, when, when I tell them, like, because usually when I say it's a French film, the immediate... Maybe mm. to a fault, the immediate expectation is like black and white four by three, like surrealism, you know, and that's kind mm. of, mm. that's kind of what that film is. And uh, although I don't think it's four by three, I can't remember, but no, I think it's actually CinemaScope. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that, that's a good one. Um, any, yeah. So any other classics uh, quick, that quickly come to mind? I want to segue soon, but uh, anything that really hits you like, oh man, I just don't get that film, you know? Uh, well, not like quickly like that but pretty much like the the uh i think it'd be e i think it'd be faster to tell you like the classics that i think are like actually classics you know that hold up oh we oh, mentioned oh, citizen oh, kane earlier give me well, that's a great the, one yeah well those, those films like i could i could go on and on about them but the thing with classics is that to me what the real absolute definition of a classic is that it's a movie that stands the test of time because you can show it to several audiences of different age, yeah. ages and cultural backgrounds and it's still impressive like I saw Citizen Kane when I was like in first year of film school so like mm. a few years back mm. and I was like blown away like it, I could I enjoyed it like it was as thrilling at some, as something I could see in like 2012 at, at, at the absolutely movies, you know? absolutely yeah and I was blown away by like the the, the creativity of that mm. so uh, I guess the real answer to your question is you know when it comes to classics or, or or what i think first of all it's important to like this is something scorsese is really adamant about to respect like whether you like him or not you have to respect the classics you know what i mean it's yeah. really important yeah. well he's made some he's made some pretty historic leaps in film preservation you know he's done yeah. a lot mm. more yeah. filmmaking so for sure i mean it's it, it's important to to, to, to know where like your movies come from like the ones you like no matter how small or independent or everything like it's all interconnected you know Absolutely. and like i would never i would never say to, that the you're only able to make these decisions and these cuts because people before you 
exactly made that risk. Exactly. Yeah, you're you're mm-hmm. you're you're an influence of an influence of an influence. Like like this, that's why um I appreciate Tarantino so much because there's a real tongue in cheek quality to him acknowledging his influences and they feel inherent to the DNA of his style. It doesn't feel like he's copying or stealing so much as this is a guy who epitomizes a certain love for cinema and he just can't help but let it see. I mean, even Scorsese was like, you got to steal wisely. I mean, he was stealing all the time, you know, from King Vidor and all these guys. Scorsese grew up on a lot of amazing sort of, you know, great filmmakers uh, from the 20s and 30s and stuff. And I know for a fact that he took from them too a little bit. And, and that's great. You know, that's what it's all about. Um, I want to actually, because the thing is, we're talking about classics, right? I actually think that, because there's, look, maybe I was born at a certain time, but I actually think that cinema has never been better than it has been today. I know that's a bit controversial for some folks because there's a certain, again, that idea of, you know, if you're born in a certain time and you're partial to a certain type of cinema, obviously it makes sense you'll appreciate that cinema more. Um, I just happen to believe from what I've seen, and this is just personally my opinion, subjective as anything, is that we're making movies like now like we never have before. You know, I I think um, the art form has been pushed. We're getting films that are so much more innovative and in spite of sort of like what you said about the new well the new well vague and you know people who are you know, again in film schools especially not able to do anything new or different because they're encouraged not to i do think that there is a lot of incentive to keep pushing the boundaries you know and i know bernard you've talked about this with me about how there should be a new new wave you know what i mean mm-hmm. mm. absolutely yeah and i think it's on the way in France, it's on the way, really. Yeah, 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 it's coming. I mm. mean, um, actually, just got me thinking of the Dardeen brothers, who aren't really part of a new new wave, but you know, they're a good example of filmmakers that uphold like a humanistic quality that's very fresh, mm. but they also have a retro vibe to their movies, in a way. You know what I mean? Like, they're almost like, like if John Cassavetes was, was in like French and was two people. <laughs> Probably go with them. Um, just came into my head, sorry about that. Um, all right, well, uh, I want to segue to something else now, which is actually today, uh, I think it was today, yeah, today, Christopher Nolan's movie Tenet, uh, the trailer for it just dropped, a new trailer for it mm-hmm. just dropped, and... Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, what's your stance on him? What's your stance on, on, uh, on him? Because he's an example of, a, of, of like an auteur filmmaker, let's say. Say what you will about him, he's you know, definitely his own voice and he's singular, and he's making movies in the studio system like nobody's business. So what do you, what's your take on Tenet, but also what's your take on the fact that we have this guy making these massive movies that are high concept without pre-existing material, like it's his original screenplay? Mm. Well, I'm going to answer, but first I'm just going to ask you for a minute, because actually I have to write to some guy from my work about an important question, mm, and I really have to answer no, this, and then I promise no I'll problem. answer your question no problem. in a bit. That's all good. That's all good. 